Hey everyone, I'm Tammy Sollenberger, the author of The One Inside, 30 Days to Your Authentic Self. This podcast is for anyone curious about who they are, the different parts of themselves, and for those who want to connect with their true self. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, welcome. On today's podcast, I talk with Dr. Nancy Morgan, certified IFS therapist. Nancy wrote the IFS and psychedelic chapter in the new upcoming book, Altogether Us, which will be released around August 2023. I spoke with Nancy on episode 47 of this podcast when we focused on her role as director of Life Moves Behavior Health and Training Program, a California agency dedicated to breaking the cycle of homelessness. Nancy introduced IFS into the training curriculum during the 2015-2016 year. Today we have a much different discussion. You may be here because you love Nancy. And you want to know and hear how she's doing. You might want to hear her voice and get a feel for her. You might want to know what's going on as she was recently diagnosed with cancer. You may be here because you don't know Nancy personally or professionally. You might just want to know more about IFS or you might want to know about psychedelics. Whatever reason brought you to this episode, I am glad you're here. And I feel incredibly honored that Nancy shares her heart and her story with us. The first half of this episode is heavier around the history of psychedelics and the integration with IFS. Nancy shares more of her personal story in the second half, although it is weaved throughout this episode. I start recording as soon as I meet with each guest, and most of that beginning matter just gets edited out. I decided to leave our entire conversation just as it is, even as we talk about, do we want to add this? Do we want to keep this in? I just leave everything as it is. The GoFundMe to support Nancy is listed in the show notes. And I just want to say how really amazing the timing of this was. Nancy just happened to be one of the first people that signed up to do the podcast in the All Together Us authors calendar. And it just happens to time when she's going for her cancer treatment. And it just happens to time when in the IFS community and probably in other communities, I think there's a lot of interest and curiosity and concern about Nancy. So I just feel really honored that um, the timing of this worked out so perfectly. I hope you're doing well. Enjoy. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing, I'm doing well. I mean, that's a loaded question, isn't it? Well, you know, I think it's actually a great question anytime if we pause and actually do check in and say, how am I doing? Today I'm doing well. Yesterday I was really tired and I'd had a sore throat for about three days. Mm. And since my diagnosis, you know, with the head and neck cancer, it's hard to have a sore throat and not kind of go to a place of curiosity, like, hmm, yeah. this be- um, so today I'm still a little raspy, but I feel a lot better. I got really good rest and yeah, yeah this little guy, this is my lucky seven month old mini, uh, Australian shepherd. And he has an early wake up clock built into his little body and he's so adorable. So I just keep going to bed earlier and earlier when he wakes up at five, uh, it means that if I go to bed at eight, eight thirty, I'm usually in pretty good shape. So when he wakes up at five, are you up for the whole day? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I know I'm recording right now, but I don't have to put any of this on. Like we can kind of talk for a second and then we can start the podcast, you know, we can start it. Sure. Um, but I do, what were you going to have to say? I, it, I'm, Tammy, I really am. um, It's what work, what feels right for you because recording is I'm here. I'm here to be with you in my current state and the reality of it. And I'm super hopeful because next Friday I'll be going to Mexico because I finally, I had a friend create a GoFundMe page to support me and the gap is closing in the amount it will cost and what I'll I have left to come up with. And so I'm feeling really hopeful, really positive. 
I love that I can get in into a non-toxic intensive program. I've never been to Cancun. So I have one day off because it's an intensive six days a week. On my day off, I'll get to be at the ocean is mm -hmm. my home. And so I'm in really good shape. So that's, that's how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful, hopeful with you, hopeful with you. I like that. Hopeful mm -hmm. with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do you feel about, about including your story in the podcast? It, it feels, this is what doesn't feel authentic to me is for us just to talk about your chapter and so we can do that. We can just talk about your chapter. Um, and, but it feels like I want to talk a little bit about what's happening for you. And maybe you can even integrate sort of how what you talked about in your chapter has been helping you through this time. But I, but I want you to feel really comfortable with what you share personally with the world. Um, but I think there's probably a lot of people out there that love you and the time this will be released if you're okay with that, like next week. Mm -hmm. So it might be oh. just really good time to have this out there in the world. I have chills right now. And for me, that's always a yes. That is what chills are for me. And um, I hadn't even thought about this, but I did sit with medicine. I sat in a medicine space with the mushroom and it is some, and what came from it felt so profound for me that I've only shared it with two people. And I was going to be sharing it with Dick as well and even considering submitting a proposal for the IFS conference, but it would be its conversations with cancer from an IFS model. And so right now, as we're speaking, I feel that's, that's exactly right. Now, I had envisioned talking about the chapter and psychedelics in general, but this would be the applied experience of accessing the wisdom of plant medicines uh, and, and what can come from it. <clears throat> um, and as I say that, there's a man who's no longer living now, but a lot of people in IFS circles refer to a maladoma somme, and he... Um, passed away a couple of years ago, and he was from the Dagara tribe of Africa. And the Dagara tribe <clears throat> has the, their belief is that the highest form of intelligence in the world is the, our plants. The second are animals, and the third are humans. And we learn from the, the animals how to raise our young, how to be in relationship. There are so many things we learn from all the, the animals. And then our greatest teachers are the plants because they've been around forever. And that you look at fungi, fungi has been around forever and ever. And for anything to survive and thrive, it has to have had an intelligence that figured out many ways to make it through whatever ice ages, whatever was happening on the planet. And right now at this time that in the West, we are now being exposed to plant medicines in a way that we hadn't been, not our Western culture. We, we are having direct experiences from a really ancient wisdom source. And there seems to be a common theme that that wisdom source has um, certainly consciousness and a desire for us to learn and grow. So that's the that's generally what I experience myself when I work with these plant medicines. I should name two because you have listeners all over that I was trained in 2019. I graduated from the fourth graduated class uh, of psychedelic assisted therapies and research, psychedelic assisted therapy and research, a certification program through the California Institute of Integral Studies. It was really based on the history of psychedelics and, and their use, which was pretty prolific in the 50s and up to the 60s when the war on drugs started to, started to manifest. Um, and law enforcement started cracking down. And for anybody who's read Michael Pollan's how to change your mind. You learn about the whole history 
of the war on drugs <laughs> that in essence was a war on people, people of color and people who were seen as um, anti-establishment, primarily hippies uh, who were resisting the draft and, and the Vietnam War. So, you know, the, the book is wonderful at, at teaching this. And it, that was a part, you know, that this learning about research and the history was a really big part of that certification program. Then I was certified as a ketamine assisted psychotherapist with a man, Ken Wolfson, his uh, partner, Julian Andres, and Jennifer Dorr, who's a practicing psychiatrist, who wrote the first, she was the lead writer for the first paper in a peer re reviewed journal, identifying the benefits of ketamine assisted psychotherapy. And <clears throat> then I sought consultation from people who'd had to go underground after the war on drugs really took hold. <clears throat> And these people, some of them are in their late 70s and early 80s, and they had been able to utilize psychedelics before they were illegal, utilize methylene dioxymethamphetamine, MDMA, before it was illegal, and campaigned to make sure it didn't get scheduled as a Schedule One substance, which means there's no medicinal value. And it was unsuccessful because the war on drugs was so um, taking hold and was so powerful at that point in our country. But thanks to the work of many people, and especially Rick Doblin, who in 86, when MDMA was fully now scheduled as a Schedule One substance in a federal offense to be in possession of it, with harsh criminal penalties, as were all psychedelics, even including the little brown mushroom, psilocybin cubensis that grows wild all over in the world, except Antarctica, because nothing grows there. Um, that, even a little brown mushroom that I can find out in the woods here, you know, we can find on the Pacific, in the Pacific Northwest, but all over, in the Southwest, in the South. There's a strain of psilocybin cubensis found in Tampa, Florida. It's everywhere wow. in the U.S. That is now illegal to be in possession of. And so uh, Rick Doblin formed MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, with the aspiration to liberate MDMA from its Schedule One status to move it over into not being scheduled at all or be, being able to be prescribed for the purpose of especially working with people with PTSD. Mm. And... Um, and so now the phase three out of three phases of trials that FDA has approved, FDA on their own fast-tracked the approval of MDMA and psilocybin. So right now, as early as next year and possibly early next year, both MDMA and psilocybin could be nationally in the U.S. nationally rescheduled. They are no longer would no longer be a a felony offense to utilize these medicines. And in Oregon, in November of 2022, uh, I'm sorry, 2020, Oregon voters not only voted through measure 110 to decriminalize all drugs, but to also legalize psilocybin specifically for use with people who don't even need a mental illness diagnosis um, to come and utilize the mushroom in a safe, regulated way where the service center where they would receive it would be state licensed. The, the, the psilocybin, which could come in the form of chocolate, gummies, you know, any way that it's been precisely measured, that's all licensed. People like me who sit with somebody have to be licensed by the state, just like I'm licensed as a LPC here in the state of Oregon. And even the person who hands it, who distributes it to the person taking it, that wouldn't be me. I'm the one sitting with them and facilitating their experience. That person has to be licensed. All of this is state regulated. And on March 12th, I just graduated among the first hundred people 
from the first program, like state license in Oregon, to now be able to be certified and sit for licensure to be one of the first psilocybin assisted facilitators in Oregon. So congratulations. So I, I'm wow. Foundation. I know that's a big foundation, but I feel it's important for people when I am yeah. going to share what I'm sharing, that this is in a legal setting. Because here in Oregon, I, I am able to utilize the mushroom for my own personal use without risk of, of state um, a, a, a state um, limitations placed on me. Or we this is, is still not true as far as the federal government goes. But Oregon has worked so hard. So many people have worked so hard. And now Colorado has something very similar that their voters voted in last year. And other states have it on the ballot. Washington's going to be trying to do something. California is going to try to be doing something so that these uh, medicines can be utilized. But for personal use right now, just in the same way that cannabis was granted, you know, a certain status, medicinal, then recreational. In Oregon, because all drugs have been decriminalized, it takes very little, as little as a gram and a half of the mushroom, which is just not very much to have an experience where you drop in and can sit for three hours and just attune to something that I would identify as being very, very connected to self. Mm. Yeah. So wanted well, to see that. Well, I appreciate that the the context of kind of where we are, because I wonder if so many people just notice their own parts when they think about this subject and what they have heard or what they believe that maybe not isn't true or isn't sort of what sort of where I don't know where we got it from, but sort of what's just come been passed down, maybe. Right. Michael Pollan's book, I would say, is the absolute best book to really understand the history of how we got to where we are today, this 40 year, 40 plus year war on drugs. Um, and, you know, Michael's a he's a journalist. His job is to dig and to find out. And mm -hmm. so and for anybody who's enjoyed any of his other books, he's also just a really good writer. So mm -hmm. it's a really good book. I also want to name, too, that just like when Prozac first came out, it was sort of seen as this wonder drug. But there are always, you know, there are always the flip side of, of things that, that we want to look at, too, and name. What I'll speak for today is just my direct experience. Everybody has their own. And some people have remarkable experiences. Johns Hopkins has been working with psilocybin for over 20 years working with people who have uh, diagnoses, terminal diagnoses, dealing with a lot of existential stress and angst. And a number of those people have identified their experience with psilocybin in the top five, or even in the top three most important experiences in their life behind getting married and having children in terms of the impact of what it, it revealed to them and how it impacted their ability to see themselves and now potentially see themselves with a terminal illness and how they would like to um, spend the rest of their life, their precious human life. Mm. So I guess I would love to hang out right there and either share some of your experiences or some of the experiences of the people that you know that you would feel comfortable sharing the idea of of what it does, why it's so amazing, but not just sort of like scientifically what it does, unless you wanted to tell that, but like yeah. why, because because I'm hearing about this all the time, right? Like people are, this is becoming not common, but so many more people are interested in this, are, you know, mm -hmm. micro dosing through the mail, you know, so I'm like, why are we doing that? <laughs> like, right. what's, right. what is, what, why are you, why are you, tell me, tell me the why that, right. that is so, um, that, right. yeah, I'm curious about that. Sure. And just for your listeners, microdosing, um, microdosing, there, there's a man, James Fadiman out of Stanford, uh, who was, he's sort of seen as the grandfather of microdosing because he did a lot of research on it. Microdosing is basically about a half a gram of the, of the dried mushroom, psilocybin cubensis we're talking about. 
And it is a very um, subtle sort of behind the scenes uh, mechanism that works to facilitate synaptic growth. And people have reported when they microdose, there's nothing psychedelic. They don't feel it. Sometimes they'll feel just maybe a little tingling sense, maybe the first day they microdose, but it will be the experience of maybe feeling yourself a little more connected to nature, maybe a little bit slower, more thoughtful and creative. And it's very popular um, in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley, there are so many people, creative people, um, that it's been really commonly talked about. People will microdose LSD. I'm going to stay with just the mushroom here for this experience. But the point is, yes, people are ordering online. People all over are wanting this. And it's still a federal offense. It is not legal. It is so nowhere in the United States other than Oregon is it legal to microdose because the mushroom is still schedule one. Now, hopefully this will change, but the high number of people trying to get it is also a testament to there. There's something happening here that's beneficial and people are writing about it. Um, there's a, an online magazine, Double Blind, that is a wonderful resource for people who want to learn about this. But recognize too, they'll state again and again, it is still not legal, but we can educate around it. So one day when it can become legal, we'll be educated and that's going to be a good place to be. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a lot of things will be set up too, like kind of ready to right. go. Um, right. So in IF, and I want to go to your experience, but I'm curious if it feels like even with just let's just say with microdosing, since I said something about that, it, do you feel like what's happening is that it just like softens the protector? So there's more self energy. So that's sort of what's happening that they're not having a psychedelic experience, but right. something's being softened so that they can tap into creativity. And it sounds like feel more self. Yeah. Right. That's right. Um, wow. We could talk for so long. I'm going to do a quick snapshot <laughs> of this. That does seem to be the case. So um, in terms of the chemistry and the mechanism, one thing I can just share is with psilocybin, there is a connection to serotonin. We, there, is, um, there is a sort of a measurable uh, increase in serotonin in the system. And that's often associated with a reduction of depression, you know, we, and, uh, but, but beyond that, I don't actually know if anybody knows. People are doing a lot of research to try to figure out how it works. Um, there are even some drug companies trying to take the psychedelic out of the psilocybin uh, just so people don't have a psychedelic experience, but maybe have just the effect of what happens uh, based on whatever's happening with the serotonin in their system. And because of course the intention would be to then patent it and make lots of money on it. Uh, but I think two primary things, MDMA, MDMA I'll speak to because that really clearly is a medicine that creates an effect that feels like you're being bathed in self and, uh, bathed in self. Imagine what that would be like for three or four hours to have your protectors relax back and actually be held in the space of self, it's heart opening. It's very much connected to our hearts. And it also can be one, and that's why it worked so well with couples who were literally on the verge of divorce back before it was made illegal and how they would have so much more compassion for each other and be able to not come from protectors and instead come from self. With the mushroom, it can be something similar. And actually there's the potential to use these two together to really have that enhanced experience where the heart opens and then the mushroom, which is often known as the teacher, just not recognized as the teacher, you'll get to sit in the presence of the teacher with your heart open. And it's a, a place that then also feels as if all parts are receiving and self is fully accessed. And what comes through is guidance and um, presence and, and 
how this can go really well is to have IFS informed preparation before we ever would have anybody utilize these medicines. So you might imagine a standard doctor's intake that looks at mental health history, physical history, contraindications. And then if a person um, feels as if that, you know, for instance, let me share high blood pressure, that's a contraindication because both MDMA and psilocybin, all psychedelics spike the blood pressure a little, but then so does working out on a treadmill. So, you know, we have to look at some of these things and recognize if somebody's on medication and this is being maintained, well, that's helpful because we can work with it. We have to find out if somebody's not maintaining their health. And then we want to be curious about why and continue to have sessions with them and really help them prepare. But an IFS intake would have questions on it that also would include I know parts of you are very excited to do this or you wouldn't be here now, but let's just check and see if you have any parts with fears or concerns and you stay with that. And when, and I've yet to meet a person, myself included, who doesn't. The, and so we listen to those parts and we spend as much time with them as possible. Why? Because we don't want to blow by them because we'll lose trust in the system if we do. And there will be a rupture that we'll need to repair, but there will be blowback. There will be, there will be backlash. And that backlash sometimes can be blocking the medicine, not even letting the medicine take effect. This is real. Even with up to grams of mushrooms, it can be entirely and completely blocked. That's, that's how, that's how effective our protective parts are. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Right. And a lot of what has been identified as the bad trip, which could be terrifying, people just being in some sort of hell realm. Well, what we find out too with careful preparation is when we really listen to parts with fears or concerns, there are things that have to do with separation. I'm afraid you'll die. I, you know, it's, it's like just Dick tells a story of when he was uh, vacationing on Kauai and has shared, and he got out in a riptide and an undertow was pulling him out and his parts were terrified. And he acknowledged, I'll be with you. We, we might die and I'll be with you. But then his sister-in-law called and said, swim, swim parallel. Don't try to struggle against the tide. And, and to recognize too, he had enough calm and presence to swim parallel mm. and saved and, and, you know, was what saved himself, but mm. parts, to be separated from self they don't want to be separate so we share with them things like mushroom this is mdma this has been used you know we've got over 20 years of fda approved trials that have looked at this and we've got millions of people around the world that have taken the substance when it was created underground who knows what it was cut with the risk there is something like dehydration mm -hmm. um, and not caring for yourself because maybe you're dancing all night long at a rave. This is different. This is a intimate dropping in and a healing intention is behind this, not a recreational intention. It's a healing intention. So we're wanting the parts to know why are we doing this and what is the hope for it? And that self will be there. But I, if I were sitting with someone my commitment is I work with my parts just like we do as therapists so that our parts don't blend with us and come between us and our relationship with the client. Mm. So it's even more heightened in the therapy, in the psychedelic setting. So I'm going to also hold space from a self-led place to not do anything. I'm not doing therapy. I'm facilitating somebody's healing because their inner healing intelligence is mm. what happens in the space with the psychedelic hmm. and but I prepare them again so it would be it would be any parts with fears or concerns so we really listen and we don't do anything until those parts say all right maybe we're not 100% on but we're 80 and but this but this better be okay yeah. you know? <laughs> yes what if we get what if we connect with you right at the end and we ask you how was it 
mm. you know, and, and then other things, you know, what are parts hoping for in the journey? Mm. If they don't get what they're hoping for, what is it that might be of concern? Mm. These are the questions that we ask people's parts all the time. Mm. You know, and if it didn't have to be doing its job all the time, and this work could also support healing of the part they protect, would they be interested? Mm -hmm. And if this healing happened and they could do something else, what would they like to do? It's just IFS. It's just IFS. And, and then the important piece is that's the prep. Then it's the sitting in the medicine. So I've done this with four clients with ketamine, which is legal. I've sat with a prescriber who legally prescribed ketamine to clients that I then just sat with. And it was a goodwill sitting. You know, as a psychologist, part of my responsibility, I'm licensed as a psychologist in California, which is where I did this. With four different clients, we did up to three years of prep. And then the ketamine experience. And I just sat and held space and the prescriber was there too. And she's a doctor who's looking at blood pressure and pulse ox, things like that. But then I processed with them at the end and what they came up with in the processing is what we integrated in their subsequent therapy sessions. And that has made for each person has made such a difference in their lives uh, to have, I mean, people have gone on to take IFS level one and level two trainings. People have gone on to become therapists through this and also have identified really significant healing has happened in their lives. And these ages were between the ages of 30 and 70. And um, a lot of healing has happened. So it's IFS in the beginning, sitting from self in the middle and IFS integration at the end. So. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, I am curious about your own experience. Um, I don't, I'd love to hear about why you got into this to begin with, what okay. um, drew, drew you to it. And then I would love to hear about your recent experience and just how it's helping you with what you're sure. dealing with right now in your life. Sure. Well, I was, you know, a girl that grew up in the mountains of Colorado and in our mountain town, everything came a bit later than it did to like the sixties came in the seventies, you know, to us. Um, and so I had friends who had older siblings that would, you know, introduce them sometimes to different psychedelics and the mushroom was one of them. So I had the experience to work with the, you know, to, I didn't work with, I, I experimented with the mushroom. I had some really beautiful experiences and I, I just loved it. Um, but my life, you know, I graduated from high school. This was in my senior, junior and senior year of high school. And I graduated and then it was about college and then it was about studying and working hard to figure out how to pay for college. And it was just that arduous, very long process for me. <clears throat> and so I left psychedelics behind. And then in the 80s, when I was in graduate school, I uh, MDMA came into my awareness and uh, and it was legal at that point and it's synthesized and a man named Sasha Shulgin, Alexander Shulgin, had synthesized it. it. The history of MDMA is included in How to Change Your Mind, so I won't include that here. But Sasha really brought back MDMA for use um, to work with, with couples and to do our own healing work. And I had a friend who had gone through a very painful and sudden divorce, um, not long after she had been married. And it appeared that maybe her husband maybe had married her to get citizenship. And so she was feeling just crushed. And I thought, well, here's this. I've heard about this. I'll try some myself. I had trusted friends who shared with me the amount to take. And so this is back in the day before drug testing, which now is something I recommend for everybody. Lots of drug testing kits are out there and available. But I had reliable friends. I, I took it and I thought, wow, it feels like my heart is wide open. And I thought, I'll bring some down to my friend. And I traveled down. She was in the LA area. And I just sat with her that weekend. And so I witnessed the healing that happened for her. I, it was stunning. And to this day, all these years later, this was maybe 1984, 
84. I think it was 84. She, she still says that was one of the most incredible experiences of my life and one that bonded us as friends forever. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I thought, oh, there's something here. So I really appreciated uh, using it with people who were having difficulties. I wasn't yet a, a therapist. And then it became a federal one substance. So I stopped using it. So that was it. And then I went on and I got my doctorate and I completed my training and got licensed. Um, And when I saw that Rick Doblin had been tirelessly campaigning to get MDMA rescheduled, I thought that's the medicine, that's it. And then um, I learned about Hopkins work with psilocybin. I thought I want to this is about healing. And at that point in 2016, I discovered IFS. And 2015 was the first graduating class from the California Institute of Integral Studies. And I was like, here we go. And that's what got me going. And it was IFS all the way. So everything, everybody who knows me in the psychedelic medicine community knows how much IFS informs everything that I share about the experiences that they are talking about. Well, I'll say, have you checked with that part to see now if it's needing to tell you more? Mm -hmm. And these are people who are in all walks of psychedelic life, researchers, Mm -hmm. prescribers, Mm -hmm. medicine workers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love that because, you you know, just with you know, just like with IFS, it's not just like the patient, which I'm putting in quotes, is yeah. doing their work. It's you're encouraging everyone that's involved, everyone to, to be paying attention yeah. to their parts. Yes. And I love this story, Nancy, because wow, I mean, you had as a young kid healing experiences and right. then witnessed that with other people. And then so it's like it's come full circle for you. It is completely full circle completely full circle. I did. I have chills right now. I never would have thought I'd be here today in Oregon too, where all of this is happening. It feels like liberation after mm. f- so many years of being bound up mm. and it, it's so beautiful. And I love, intro- I'm so appreciative that the IFS Institute has now been focusing, you know, IFS level one trainings that build a component in so that people who are coming from the psychedelic medicine world can learn IFS and expand their capacity to prepare people to hold space and to integrate because they do it too. Their preparations are often shorter. It's not the therapy that we do as therapists, but it's educating people who've been doing this work with people for a long time. Sometimes they'll go to Mexico where they can do it legally, Peru, Brazil, the Netherlands, and they're wanting to learn as much as they can. And for those who are who are daring and I think courageous to do this underground, they're wanting to do it well. Mm-hmm. And so I love that IFS is speaking to them. Yeah, beautiful. What I here's what happened to me. Um, My beloved little brother in October let me know that he had to go into the hospital and I, I lived two hours north of him and I asked what was wrong and he said he thought he had kidney stones. And so then I heard that he went to the ER and then he was home and he had a catheter and the next text I got from him was early November and it was a hospital bracelet again with his name and he said hi Nan I'm back in. And I drove down to Redding, California. I live in Ashland, Southern Oregon. And so uh, he was in the ER in terrible, excruciating pain. And they were trying to figure out what was wrong. The catheter kept blocking. He was, his system was in distress because his bladder was coming close to, to rupturing. And so I was in and out and in and out of the hospital with him. My sister flew out from Colorado. Uh, his three housemates were there taking him in and out and we were all covering for each other as the hospital was trying to figure out what was wrong and trying to keep him out of pain but his pain started to just be felt throughout his body like in his bones and when they did a scan of his bladder they saw metastases in his lymph nodes around his below his bladder and his groin area and the lower lobes of his lungs had masses, metastases. And they did a biopsy of the bladder mass and it was squamous cell carcinoma. And they couldn't find the uh, 
the primary site, which is what they look for for treatment with radiation, it had metastasized all over his body. He was stage four. And they continued to do numerous tests, just I think trying to figure out, should we take out his bladder? Could that help? But ultimately he started to waste away and we finally brought him home. And I believe we brought him home to his house December 6th. And on December 13th, he passed away under hospice care. And my sister and I and his three housemates were there as we were with him when he took his last breath. So uh, I came back to Oregon and I had noticed for about a year, a swollen lymph node on my left. I, it was a swollen gland, I thought, and then I noticed it was lower. And I, I recognized I was in a lot of stress. I was living out of hotels to be down near John, trying to see clients, trying to get him to appointments and just be with him. And, uh, and I made a video appointment to have this looked at, but I had to cancel. It was a day there was so much going on with him. And so when I, after he passed and I was back home in Oregon, on January 5th, I went in and saw my primary care provider and said, could we look at this? And she immediately looked at, she said, I'm treating this stat. We're getting an ultrasound and we're going to get a biopsy. And she was on it so quickly that within, I think a week and a half, the biopsy came through and it was squamous cell carcinoma. And the metastases to my lymph node um, was of concern because it was identified as a particular type, which is a P16 squamous cell carcinoma, which told the doctors it was a head and neck cancer. And the first thing they did was they do a scope, a laryngoscopy, and they look to see if they can find where it is in the throat, the head and neck. They couldn't. So then a PET scan followed by a CT scan, followed by an MRI. They couldn't find the primary site which was critical because when you can't find a primary site to target radiation to, then you're exposed to the highest level of radiation and chemo. They basically hit you with what they can, hoping it's gonna knock out the cancer, but it also knocks out a whole lot. And this is such a delicate area. We taste, we swallow, we communicate, we breathe. And for me, I was very clear that if we can't find a primary site, which my hematology oncologist said would be bad news. He said that it will not be good news if we can't find a primary site. I knew I didn't want to expose myself to that level of toxicity. And so um, after the MRI, what, it, what all of this did reveal was I, it hadn't metastasized to any other organs. So I wasn't stage four like my brother. Instead, it had just metastasized to the lymph node. Then the next thing was going to be one final sort of pretty, they told me a pretty uh, intense inspection of my throat area that would require general anesthesia because they had to really get in and look in places that were very hard to see, just in hopes that even though these other, these other ways of, of finding this cancer did not reveal a primary site that maybe somehow they could, that's where I paused. And I just said, I need to pause. This was already getting expensive. It was already up to $10,000 out of pocket expense just for these exams. We hadn't even started treatment. And I'll be 65 in June. And I thought, I just need, to, I need help with Medicare. I'm gonna need some help here. And so I, I just told my team, I wanna slow down. I just needed some time. And I decided to sit with the mushroom. And so, I have friends that let me be at their house where I just set up their back room. They babysat my little dog for me and they just stayed in the house in case I needed anything. And I took a very low dose of the mushroom and I just sat in it. And what I experienced was the first thing that I, I will tell you sitting in the mushroom, when I say sitting in the medicine, it was that I just got very calm. I put this shawl on with, that I'm wearing today, which was a gift from many of my colleagues in the medicine community. And I had my journal nearby and I would just softly listen and I breathed. I invited my parts. I worked with my parts to just sit and be present. We're all here together. 
to be open to receive if there was any guidance around how best for me to go forward. And one of the first things I got, I when I say I got, it's like I heard it, but it came as a sense. It was tasting and swallowing are very important. Period, that's it. And then it moved into very general um, information. And that general information started to include being slow and listening and looking at ways to strengthen myself because I had become weak. I had been under incredible stress. So the first thing was how to rebuild my, myself. And in doing that, as I was doing that, what I was getting was I'd been vegan and vegetarian, vegetarian and then vegan. And what I got was water. Water is very important. Salt water is very important. Take salt baths. And I had a part that came in that said, but that's wasteful. We've been in a drought. And, and what I heard was there is enough water, mm. Take salt baths, eat of the sea. And that also came and of water. And then I also got, um, I'd been wanting a hot tub forever, but I felt I couldn't afford it. And, and what I got was that is closed water, but it is good because it will move you like the waves of the ocean move you. And so I looked, I'm just going to tell you, fast forward, I looked into hot tubs and there was a promo for a hot tub where I was able to get 18 months interest free. And I now have a hot tub in my backyard that I take every day. And it feels so healing to me, that hot water just moving around my body. Because what I'd learned too is during my stress and how many clients I was seeing during COVID and then following all of what happened with John, I was sitting for hours and hours and not moving, not exercising and not, and becoming unhealthy. And that's when I first was noticing I have that lump. Mm. But then what followed was what has impacted me the most. I then acknowledged what I heard. And I just sat further and then I connected with the cancer. And what I connected with was I, I had first, I want to preface, I had first, I'd been in Costa Rica with Dick and Jean and so many of my IFS colleagues. And I had told Dick about the cancer, Dick and Jean and, and a couple others. And I said, you know, I'm feeling like maybe it's like an unattached burden that came into my system. And if I can work with it and release it, you know, I'd like to do that. And that's what I had consciously thought in the medicine. I got something very different. What I got was this cancer did not know what birthed it. It was very confused and it was very desperate to live because it was all alone and it and all it knew was that it needed to live it just needed to live and it was desperately trying to but it had no relationship with any other cells and it just was it it was miserable it was it was desperate and miserable and then i got the virus the hpv virus that was in my system that came in like an unattached burden can come in. That was not part of my system. It had come in and it had been in my system. And when my system, finally, my immune system was not strong enough, the HPV virus got into one of my good cells and shifted it. And that cell then found itself unlike anything it had known. And now it was just simply trying to live. And I felt such compassion for it as I listened to it and felt its desperation. It put me in a place of awe, actually. And I started to recognize how when we don't understand something, our habit is to hunt it down and kill it, to get rid of it. And I recognized how 
yes, chemo and radiation, they are, they work very well to, to do exactly that. But often then there's no sense of going to the source of what was underneath it. Mm. And often cancer will reappear. And so I was getting all of this and so much more and recognized there's more I want to listen. And I want to listen and I want to learn and I'm going to be staying with this. So uh, then when I came out of that, there was much more, but when I came out of that, that really stayed with me. And that's when I recognized I wanted to start finding, I wanted to find a program that was non-toxic that would support me building my immune system, really strengthening my relationship with my healing and healthy self and look at ways to one, have my immune system be able to fight off the virus, the HPV virus, so it could no longer infect healthy cells and to then work with this cancer to transform it. Mm -hmm. And we are in the work of transformation as therapists and in IFS, we know healing is possible. This may seem almost like it, how could that be possible? Could a cell that's become cancerous be healed? I don't know. But many people didn't believe that somebody who was suffering as much as our clients do could ever be healed either. And we now know they can. Mm. So that's where I am right now. And I thank you so much for creating the opportunity for me to share this with you. Thank you, Nancy, for sharing um, what's going on and just being open and real. Um, do you think it would be okay for me to share the GoFundMe page that your friend set up for you? Uh, well, sure. Yeah. I, I can send you the link to it. I have it. Right. Oh, yeah. you have? It. Yeah. Okay, Tammy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it has been spreading in the IFS community, in the psychedelic uh, medicine community, and just among family and friends. It's been so, I can't even tell you, I have three lessons that I have now been learning that are gifts from this uh, that really have begun with this diagnosis. One is to identify that I have needs. Mm. And the other is to then share that I have needs with other people. And the final, the final thing I'm learning is, and to then be open to receive. And I would like to say I was kind of okay at that, but I wasn't. Mm -hmm. Those have always been areas of growth for me. And now I feel I've been so humbled and I feel so open and I am getting it on levels that I don't know I could have ever gotten otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for being with me today, for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. It's been an honor and a privilege, Tammy, and I'm so glad you created your beautiful podcast. And so glad that you're supporting the beautiful work that Jenna Remsra has done with All Together Us, and you're giving a platform to us. My chapter, I believe it is chapter 16, is on integrating psychedelic experiences with IFS. So that will be out this summer. Yeah, I, I look forward to it. And, and uh, yeah, just thank you again for sharing you with us. Mm-hmm. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I wish you a beautiful day. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, like, all the things. My book is available at your favorite independent bookstore or all the places books are available. You can also visit my website, TammySallenberger.com, where you can download a free meditation on getting to know your should parts. You know, there's parts of you who remind you of what you should be doing. They sound a bit critical at times. Yes, we all have them. You can follow me at IFS Tammy on Instagram and Twitter and the One Inside Facebook page. I'm so grateful for Jack Reardon, who created the new music. Jack is a graduate of Derek Scott's IFS Stepping Stone program. Thanks, Jack, for getting me. And to you, thanks for listening.